Okay. Well, thank you very much for coming today. I'm Herb Fockler uh, with the law firm of Wilson Sonsini. Uh, we're co-sponsors of uh, this entrepreneur workshop, um, and uh, along with Wharton San Francisco uh, School. And I've got to say, this is the first time I've been here. What a fantastic, you know, uh, facility this is. This is amazing. So um, I don't think I'd get any work done because uh, I'd be staring out the windows of the bay the whole time. Um, but uh, we're absolutely delighted to uh, to be able to sponsor this with uh, the Wharton School, and we're also delighted uh, with today's speaker. Uh, uh, professor Thomas Lee. Um, he's a professor of operations and information technology management, uh, and he'll be teaching um, here at uh, Wharton in the uh, in the fall. Um, he's taught here before and also uh, taught as a pr uh, professor over at uh, UC Berkeley's Haas School. Um, and his current research focuses on text and data mining to support innovation and entrepreneurship. Uh, he holds an undergraduate degree in symbolic systems and political science. I want to ask what that is, uh, from Stanford and master's and doctoral degrees uh, in engineering systems, from the engineering systems division at MIT. Um, he's also been a visiting scientist at the National Institute of Standards and Technologies, um, a research engineer at MITRE Corporation, and uh, contracted with Dynacorp, Dynacorp um, supporting work for DARPA. So we're, we're absolutely delighted to have him here. If I can cover one or two uh, administrative things before we start. Uh, the first one is uh, we have a new feature for those of you out in the uh, the uh, internet audience uh, today. Uh, you are able to ask questions and we encourage you to do so. If you look on your screen um, in the upper left, uh, it's the second icon in from the left uh, right below the Wharton logo. Um, if you click on that, uh, a, a uh, box will come up where you can ask uh, uh, type in your questions, and then they'll be ready right here to ask them. Um, ask them of uh, Tom. So uh, hopefully uh, that'll um, improve uh, the uh, the internet experience of all this. Also, our next presentation is uh, uh, the social media e-commerce startups transforming the landscape. Um, we're delighted to have Anu Nayum, uh, past president of Sandhill Angels, and John Soberg from Bloomberg Capital. Um, that will be down in Palo Alto at our offices at Wilson Sonsini, and that's Friday, February 17th. Once again, remind you that you can find all of these uh, presentations on the web at tinyurl.com, and then WEP, Wharton Entrepreneurs Program Workshops. WEP Workshops is the, uh, the link for it. Uh, also, one more thing, sorry for all the advertisements. Uh, we'll have uh, the uh, legal open house um, for about an hour after today's presentation where I'll uh, um, uh, entertain any questions any of you have in a, in a fairly informal setting on uh, starting up companies uh, or anything else that uh, uh, might have a legal or perhaps non-legal uh, uh, nature to uh, being an entrepreneur. So with all that done, uh, I think I've pushed too far. Let me go back. There we go. Tom, can I turn it over to you? you know, welcome here, and thanks so much for uh, joining us. Thank you. Let me just put that down. Yeah. I don't think I need that, right? Yeah. Great. So thank you for having me here. Uh, I'm really excited to be here. As Herb mentioned, I was previously on the, so I spent eight years on the faculty in the Philadelphia campus in the Department of Operations and Information Management, so OPM, I'm sure you're all rolling your eyes, you know, can't believe you had to take so many core courses in that area. Uh, but that's, that's, from a contextual standpoint, that makes sense. It's gonna drive this discussion because you could think about innovation, you could think about identifying opportunities as sort of a, you know, lightning strikes you, hits you in the head, and you know, you're off and running, right? So you can think of these, you know, sort of a, a one-shot wonder or people that are generating, you know, starting companies and, and, and carrying on. But coming from an operations background, the perspective that, that we take is that you can think about entrepreneurship from a process standpoint. Right? So rather than waiting for lightning to strike, are there a set of steps? Is there a process that you can go through to innovate, to develop new products, and to bring ideas to market? And so it's from that perspective. What is the process of entrepreneurship? What's the process of new product development that I'll be speaking from 
And of course, today, what we'll start with is the beginning of that process. Right? How do you identify an opportunity? So out of curiosity, how many people here are currently or have been entrepreneurs? Right? Right, so a, a good percentage of the room. So that, that'll give us a good place to start with. So to begin with, and uh, credit here goes to a friend, Sakargani at uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers for, for the idea of this slide. Um, but the first thing I'll point out is, when you think about innovation, when you think about entrepreneurship, there are a lot of ideas out there. And so when we think about opportunity identification, if you can't think of any other idea, you might as well write a book. Right? So that's, <laughs> that, that's sort of your first opportunity. But the second thing I'll point out is, there's, you know, broadly speaking, lots of different perspectives on this. So I'm not here to suggest that there's any one right answer. Rather, what I'd like to do is to put a stake in the ground and say, there's a definition for innovation that we will use for today's discussion. Right? So feel free to disagree with this definition, but it's going to motivate or it's going to be the foundation from which we drive today's conversation. Right? So what, for the perspective of today's conversation, can we think of as innovation? Right? Innovation we can think of as some sort of a matching between a need and a solution. For today's discussion, that's what we're going to think about innovation as. And so with that in mind, you can think of, well, so where does the innovation come in? You can think about the innovation in one of three different places from this definition. Right? You can think about innovation in terms of the solution. Right? So probably everyone is here, has heard about that accidental discovery uh, that 3M made for removable adhesives. Right? So, so we know about that in terms of, of uh, Post-it notes. And, and they've, of course, expanded that into, into a number of different dimensions. But here was a novel compound, a novel solution, and then they went out looking for problems to solve with it. Right? You can think about innovation also in terms of the need. Right? It's not clear that anyone knew that they needed to share their lives in 140 characters with you know, the rest of the world. Who knew? Right? As it turns out, we all need to know what Ashton Kutcher and Demi Moore are you know, doing tomorrow and you know, what they're eating, right? up to the minute. So some notion of novelty with respect to the need. And then you can also think about novelty not with respect to any sort of a solution, any strategy, not necessarily with respect to identifying a novel need, but merely in how you match. Right? So iPods are now so ubiquitous you probably find them in garbage cans. Right? But if we go back and remember when the iPod, uh, when the iPod excuse me, came out, quite, we thought of it as a revolutionary device. And yet the hardware, that hard disk that it used, the music management software, even the rotary dial, right? all of those pieces, those technical components, came from other places. Right? The, the demand for online music, to carry music around with you, right? to, to be able to download it, to upload it, also a well understood at the time, well recognized need. The novelty lay in how Steve Jobs and company put all of those different pieces together. Right? And of course, you can think about novelty in any of these dimensions. You can think about innovation, but we are, of course, here at the Wharton School. And so what we're really interested in is not so much just in innovation for innovation's sake. We're interested in successful innovation. right? And by successful, we'll talk about the ability to create value. Right? And value, of course, as we know now, certainly couched here in the Bay Area, value does not necessarily need to be measured in numerical terms, in, in financial terms. Right? We can think of it in a broader social sense and social good. But at the end of the day, what we're really interested in is identifying opportunities for innovation that will generate value. Right. So with that in mind, knowing that we think about innovation in terms of solutions and need, we can describe the opportunity space in terms of these two dimensions. Right? So think about a plane, right? coordinate axes, where in one dimension we talk about how well do we understand the need? Right? Because that's one way of identifying opportunities for innovation. Alternatively, we can think about the horizontal axis as our understanding of the technologies, the, the solutions. Right? So how well in this particular two-dimensional space right, lies the realm of opportunity? And so the exercise for us today is to ask, is there a process for navigating this space? So let's think about this a little more. So first, this idea of what does it mean to understand the solution? 
right? So PTFE, right? Is anyone familiar with this compound? Polytetra. Uh, who raised their hand over here? Yep, you are. Zach. Zach. So trade polytetrafluoral, uh, polytetrafluoral ethylene, ethylene, right? Ethylene, yeah. right? Uh, trade name Teflon, right? Which we're sort of all familiar with it in terms of our nonstick pans, right? But does anyone actually know what the first large commercial application for Teflon was? Dental Sorry. Dental so dental floss we'll get to in a second. Not not the first application. First commercial application for Teflon. Interestingly, the first large-scale commercial application for Teflon was actually in a seal for pipes and for valves. It was used in the Manhattan Project at Oak Ridge National Labs. Right? That was the initial application of Teflon. Right? It was only in the 1950s that it was a Frenchman, of all people, who driven not by him, right, apologies to French, right? <laughs> not driven by himself, but of course it was his wife who pointed out to him the real demand. She said, hey, this thing is so slippery, you really ought to put this thing on a pan, right? And that's where the first line of Teflon cookware, TFAL, or T-E-F-A-L in the rest of the world, but T-F-A-L, TFAL in the US, right, came from. That's why the French always say, chercher la femme. <laughs> right. So, so we have the first driver was actually pipe, was, was as a sealant. And in fact, today, we know it as plumber's tape, right? For those of us who, well, for, you know, for those of us that have had experience in, in having to fix leaks, right? Plumber's tape is, is Teflon, right? Now, we, who, you are? David. David? So David mentioned the idea of, of dental floss, right? We went from nonstick pans uh, rather, we started from plumber's tape and seals to nonstick pans to, to dental. Who actually manufactures this dental floss? Anybody know? Who sells Glide dental floss? Uh, P&G, right? So Procter & Gamble. Right? Maybe there's a branding problem for P&G here, right? So, <laughs> so Procter & Gamble, but do they actually manufacture Glide dental floss? Everyone's like checking on their, you know, online right now. Wait, who manufactured? So the manufacturer of Glide dental floss is actually Gore-Tex, right? What do, you, what do we think of when we think of Gore-Tex? We're here in the Bay Area, so there should be a relatively obvious. We think water repellent, outdoor clothing, right? This is sort of environment. How did Gore-Tex get into this business? Anyone know the background behind Gore-Tex? You are? Neil. They have an innovation process. So they have an internal innovation process. What was Gore-Tex, what was their first foray into this market, into Teflon? It wasn't dental floss. It wasn't outdoor wear. How did Gore-Tex actually make its name? Surgery Through, sorry? Surgery you are? Brad, so Brad mentioned in the medical, in medical device industry, Gore-Tex's first product, and still one of their biggest products, is actually an insulated cables. So finding and expanding PTFE and using it to generate insulated cable. If you think way back in the day when, when our computers, we still had to connect a hard drive or a printer with a ribbon cable, right? that was their first product. Generating ribbon cables and the insulation around ribbon cables with Teflon. Coming up with a technology, PTFE, and looking for opportunities to apply that through a better understanding of what that technology is, what its properties are, and how it can be applied. Right? That's what we can think of when we think about knowledge of the solution. So what do we think of when we think about knowledge of need? Now, I understand that uh, it was about a month ago, I think, that you guys actually had the design team for OXO in. Right? How, many people here were actually, how many people were actually here for that talk? Right? So, so a few guys were. So, so someone tell me about the story behind OXO Good Grips. Uh, Charles? Yeah, well, um, the, uh, the uh, innovator had a wife who's suffering from arthritis. Again with the wife. So the important note here is if you want to innovate, <laughs> have a spouse. Right. <laughs> so he, he um, came up with the 
large handled kitchen utensils to help her handle kitchen work with her arthritis. Because of arthritis, because it was difficult for her to grip things. Ergo, good grips. Can you think of any other markets where people have difficulty gripping things? Arthritis certainly is a source of our inability to hold and close. Any, uh, you are? Maya? Maya? So, so children, right? So I, I don't know about the rest of you. I happen to have an almost three-year-old. She, she reminds us constantly she's almost three now. <laughs> so uh, an almost three-year-old at home. And so here, of course, is another market, right? Difficulty gripping. Same intuition, right? Just a slightly expanded market, right? So once I better understand what the driving need is, I can begin to look around me and ask, well, are there other related needs? Right? So toothbrushes as well, although OXO isn't in the toothbrush business, tooth, toothbrush business yet. But they have, in fact, expanded into a child, a child utensil line. Right? So it's sort of a natural extension through a better understanding of the need. So the process today that we'll talk about is a systematic exploration of what it means to understand needs, what it means to better understand the technologies. Okay? So first. If we just start with better understanding needs, right? what would you think, what are some intuitive approaches to understanding what consumer needs are? Someone just asked you today, tell me, you know, go find out some needs consumers have. What would you do? Uh, you are? Becca. Becca? So, so you'd talk to people. You'd, you'd interview them. Right? That sounds good. Right? So, so interviewing, and we're familiar with that, particularly if you, you know, for those that have a background in marketing. Interviewing, absolutely. You are? Pam. Pam? Right, so this is sort of like gorillas in the mist, Jane Goodall, right? I need to actually go watch these people. I'm, I'm not just going to listen to them. I have to go, go follow them and, and see what they're doing because, heaven forbid, they should actually tell me what they're really doing, right? So there's, we, we, we can interview people. We can follow them, sort of, it's called user anthropology. You are? Nikhil. Nikhil? Ask your wife. <laughs> Ask your wife, <laughs> right? So, so interviewing, talk to spouse, right, note to self. Anything else you can think of? You are? Julie. Sorry? Julie? Julie? Mm -hmm. So you set up experiments with different people to see if that will happen. So I can sort of run experiments. So instead of necessarily following people out in the field, I could sort of bring them into a lab in sort of a laboratory setting, do the equivalent. So simulation or, or lab testing. Uh, we're here in the heart of Silicon Valley. Can anyone think of anything else they might approach, think about to try and understand where people have? You are, oh. So Nikhil talked about search traffic, so let me back up a little bit. So broadly speaking, I can start using the medium that we have today that we didn't have you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago. I can look at the online space. Right? People say all kinds of things, whether they're in Twitter feeds, whether they're in online forums. I, I mean, oh, you are, oh, sorry. It, what was your name again? Orit. Or, Orit. So can you say a little bit more about what you mean by values? I, I can think about I'm different meetings for it. So. Sorry? For example, I'm an educator. Mm -hmm. I'm a and I believe in science education. And there, was not, there wasn't much offers. And a lot of people strongly believe in science education. Right. So the idea of being able to, whether it's look online or whether it's interviewing people or whether it's following people around, but to get a sense of what it is they think of as important. Right? And they think of it as important. They're talking about it. They're making noise about it because they feel that there's an, a need not met. Right? So we can think about interviews or focus groups as a traditional means. We can think about user anthropology. We can think about looking at social media or, or search. 
right? So let's, let's talk about those things, focus groups and interviews. Right? So certainly there's a, a set of things that we can learn from interviewing people or focus groups. Right? So coming back to our two, three-year-olds, so not my daughter, but you know, she, she is in fact you know, in this size. Right? So uh, not Procter & Gamble in this case with Todd. This is Kimberly Clark. Right? Kimberly Clark actually went out into the field. Right? They talked to parents in playgrounds, in their homes, what do you suppose came out of this series of interviews when they wanted to pinpoint what is the question that parents feared the most when they met new kids in the playground? Right? You know, so, so one of the ways that we meet other people is we bring our children to the playground. They end up playing, you know, your kid beat up my kid. Hey, we, we should be friends. Right? <laughs> so what, what's the question parents fear the most when they, when they meet a new parent for the first time? What made them the most nervous? You know, what do you do for a living? You know, where do you live? What question made them the most nervous? You are, sorry, you are? Jen. Jen, is your child potty trained? Strikes fear and right, oh my goodness, you know, my kid's not potty trained yet. They're not gonna get into college. They're doomed. <laughs> right? That's the question they feared the most. Right? And out of this, of course, what do we find? Right? Opportunity, right? In 1989, Kimberly Clark rolled out, I think it was 89, rolled out, what is this? It's not a diaper, right? Is, is my kid in diapers? Uh, no, my, you know, potty train, my child is no longer in diapers. My child is now in pull-ups, right? Never mind that it's basically a diaper, it's just enclosed, right? Instead of, you know, with the sticker tabs, right? This is not a diaper. It addresses that underlying fear that parents have, this need, right? And of course, for Kimberly Clark, was this a huge stretch, right? They already had another product called Depends on the market, right? Depends had been on the market for five years already, right? And so you think about, I better understand the need, which allows me to find applications for some technologies that I already have, right? Now, of course, you can say, well, so I'm gonna talk to my friends, I'm gonna talk to my spouse, uh, but how do we identify, you know, who do we talk to, right? How do we figure out who it is we speak to, whether it's interviewing them, uh, talking to them on the street, following them in the field? Is anyone familiar with this product? Uh, so, uh, help me out one more time. Maya. Maya. Right, well, so, so there are in fact two different products. So there is a, a sleep-related product that has a band that helps monitor your sleep cycles, right? And so that, that's one product. The Lark, this is actually uh, an MIT product. There was a Sloan School student who, in her second year, identified this opportunity and rolled it out. You know, so every now and then something useful comes out of MIT, but you know, so <laughs> generally not. But so this, this is an MIT spin-out from Sloan. So this student created a band that you wrap around your wrist. And so rather than a, an audible alarm, what it does is it you know, vibrates to wake you up. Right? So silent alarm is my example. What's the need for something like that? Can anyone think of any possible reason why you would want a silent alarm? You are? Laura. Laura? You don't want to wake your spouse maybe? <laughs> we were talking about, you know, if you wake up your spouse prematurely, they'll never speak to you again and then you'll miss out on these innovation opportunities, <laughs> right? So I don't want to wake up my spouse. That's certainly something to think about. What else? Someone who's yeah, all right. Someone who is deaf. Someone who is? Deaf. Oh, deaf, absolutely. Uh, Pam? Yeah, somebody doesn't want to be woken up by a jarring alarm. Right, <laughs> right. Dif difficult, you know, sort of you know, that shock, my heart just stopped sort of a thing, right? So maybe more gentle and it's? Sleeping child. So sleeping child. Right? So other people in the room, right? We're, this came out of a university, right? We were all in university, you know, maybe recently or not so recently, right? So, or still in. Yep. Military applications, so military applications, silent. Right? So, 
So, all, so we immediately, right, in this room, right, in 10 seconds, or maybe a minute, we just came up with five, six, seven different applications for this, right? So the motivation for the founder was, in fact, that her partner, now spouse, was one of those, you know, rather sick individuals who likes to wake up at 5.30 in the morning to go work out, right? Those people probably shouldn't be allowed to live or something, <laughs> right? But, but, you know, she was like, you've got to be kidding me, right? So certainly this idea of you don't want to wake up your spouse, right? So when she did the next logical thing, which is I have this opportunity, why don't I go see if I can find some, some verification, some support, what did she learn? What was the feedback that she got? Right? Again, the lesson is talk to your spouse. <laughs> right? But the bottom line being, there were, I, mean, I mean, this group of people, they're paid to figure out great ideas. They had no idea that there was a motivation, a market for something like this. It wasn't until they, and if you think about it, this is part of the market, right? This is the market for this. These are customers, and yet they have no idea, right? And so when we think about interviewing, when we think about focus groups, the, the point being, it's important, right? You don't want to focus on a homogeneous audience, right? Don't leave out your spouse, right? Make sure that you're talking to a heterogeneous audience to try and get a better understanding of what the underlying opportunities and the underlying needs are. So the idea of anthrop user anthropology, right, uh, the gorillas in the mist, right, is also an intuition, right, to follow users out in the field. And as, a, as Julie, Julie, right, as Julie pointed out, if you can't follow people in the field, you can also go a long ways through simulation and lab testing, right? So these are Nissan test engineers, and what are they doing? Crash gear is one possibility. So intuitive design for blindfolding. So dark glasses, big thick gloves, braces on the neck, the knees, barely can move. How do I feel when I'm older? Right. We think about it. This growing market, it, it's a demographic trend in Japan, certainly in the United States as well. Right? But we think about how are my customers going to interact with my products? Where are the needs? Right? Their test engineers are, by and large, not in this age bracket. So how do they get this experience? How do they learn right, by observing rather than having people tell them where those opportunities are? They simulate. So the, these are Nissan test engineers. This happens to be Ford. They have a, a similar sort of uh, suit. This happens to be the Ford suit, but what's this gentleman doing? Can people tell? He's not in a car. What, what's he trying to do, Pam? He's getting into a seat, not a car seat, right? Not, he hasn't taken sort of a Recaro, you know, uh, sort of driver's seat and stuck it in his living room. Right? He's just getting into a regular chair. Right? Furniture designers borrowed these tools because for them, there's this market as well, right? This aging market that needs to use not just vehicles, but desks, chairs, tables, right? So how do I adapt, right, my exploration to better understand, right, where the needs really are? Now, and we can think about this, oh, you think, oh, physical goods, manufactured goods, we're here in Silicon Valley, you know, this isn't really our, our scope, right? This doesn't really apply to us, and yet, so think about you know, a page that, you know, how many people here have not bought something from Amazon? Right. Jeff Bezos is very happy, right? So you've all made Jeff very, very pleased, right? So this is, of course, you know, the Amazon web page. This is the Amazon web page viewed through macular degeneration. This is the Amazon web page viewed through diabetic retinopathy. Right. This is the Amazon web page viewed through someone with glaucoma. Right. When we think about our goods and services, we don't want to think only in terms of these manufactured goods or think that this idea of simulating my user, understanding the environment, 
only applies to these physical or manufactured goods, right? Even in the information economy, understanding how our users interact with the products and services that we develop and push out has a great deal of salience, right? So understanding where those limitations come from, right? Okay, so I can certainly simulate. I can also use social media, right? So um, thinking back to, is anyone familiar with this product? Uh, often, does anyone actually have one of these Camelback? Yeah, so. So uh, it's, again, it's Zach. Zach. So tell me about this product. Um, it's very versatility to sort of, as you know, easily carry, you know, water to hydrate with, like that kind of thing. So core product, right, carry water on the go, spun out into this product. Anyone have one of these bottles? Whether it's here or right, around them. Uh, it, I see, well, not a Camelback bottle, tragic. Right, but, but yeah, you should apologize for that, right? No, but, but something similar, right? This sort of uh, not, you know, BPA-free, of course, right? But a BPA-free, you know, plastic or, you know, bottle to carry water, complete with a straw and a, and a little sort of rubber sippy stopper at the, at the top that you can suck with, which, by the way, is essentially the same compound that they use in their bite valve, right? So applying the technology, slightly different market. So when we look online, and this is probably a little hard for you guys to, to see, so let me read it to you. So these are online reviews from Camelback's website. My little kids seem to think the valve is a binky and they chew on it. My teething bottle-fed child is much more drawn to my bottle, to my bottle, over any other. What does that tell you? Right? <laughs> Two years ago, what did Camelback come out with? Awesome. Right? And of course, the first generation of these bottles, there were only two colors, pink and green. I'm sure green was for the girls. So the question is, who's the pink for? Right? Why, why is it, right? So my wife, of course, being someone who's you know, vehemently anti-pink, you know, sort of, you know, she should be you know, strong, individual, female, doesn't need pink. Right? So you're thinking green versus pink. What do you suppose the difference is between this bottle and that bottle? It's like half the size. The margin is different. Right? It, the margin is different. It's half the size. How, how much do you suppose that bottle costs? Just as much. You go to REI and this little bottle costs just as much as that one. It's like half the size. It also has the little decals on it. Pretty colors. So we, of course, were at REI looking at these bottles, and what did I say to my wife? You know, operations guy, think value. Get the big, of course you get the big one. What did my wife say? You're an idiot. How is she supposed to pick this thing up? <laughs> right? I mean, at the time that we got this, this thing was like half her height. She was like, how is she supposed to drink out of this thing? I said, well, she could put it between her knees and <laughs> like this. We bought the big bottle. <laughs> and she's big enough now to lift it. Right? But the idea is by looking at this online noise, right, I can begin to identify opportunity. Now, this is in fact a relatively new space. So let me ask you, if I said you could look online, if you went to your boss, if you went to your spouse, and said, I identified this opportunity to innovate by reading comments online, what kind of pushback would you expect? or if someone told you that they were going to innovate based upon online comments, how would you push back? Think critically. Pam. It's not a relative sample, sample size. So, so not a relative sample size. I was gonna say they're outliers, because people online don't seem to innovate. Right, so we tend to think of a bimodal distribution in terms of online commentary, people who really love things and people who really hate things, right? And who knows how representative this sample is. Worse than that, you're only focusing on people who are online, right? There's a large portion of the world, heaven forbid, right, that gasp. They don't actually go online for things. Um, you, you are Martin? I think the other problem is that it's a biased sample because these folks already bought the product versus people that may buy the product. So also biased in that, well, there's an interesting un underlying point that Martin is, is bringing us, which is, in principle, we think that these are people that have already purchased the product. They've already made the commitment. In reality, 
right? We have no idea whether these people have purchased the product or not. We don't even know if they're shells for the company, right? We know, if we've been reading online, we know for places like Hotwire, for you know, Hotels.com, this is a real problem, right? Service organizations, who knows who, would actually pay people to go in and goose their ratings by writing you know, wonderful terminology online. So there are a lot of questions about our ability to filter through this noise. Well, so, so this is some research that I've been doing with Eric Bradlow in the marketing department, where we said, well, we actually want to know if we can use text mining, right? If we can mine online product reviews, online blogs, to figure out whether we can identify these opportunities, right? And of course, the open question is, well, there's bias here, bimodally distributed customers, you're not getting a clear signal. How would you check this? How would you backstop? How would you verify whether or not searching online was a valid approach? Um, yeah. Nick Hill. So I would perhaps do, use some traditional methods, like surveying or focus groups, and compare the two. Seems like a reasonable response. What else would you guys do? What else might you do? It, it's a very real opportunity. People are, are, you know, want to make use or leverage all of this available information. And the open question is, is, is it at all valid? You are? John. John. You could probably go back historically, for instance, with the uh, Camelback, and see over time, did they actually Im implement the new product? Did they implement new products? Does the market reflect what the reviews actually say? Right? So, so here's actually what we, we did. We said, we looked at some traditional methods, right? Expert reviewers, um, interview, you know, uh, using uh, customers and interviewing customers, uh, survey, in, in our case, surveying. So we compared to traditional methods and said, and asked ourselves, I wonder if we find similar sorts of attributes, right? And then to, help me out one more time. No, no, no your, your name again? John. John. So John, John said, well, what I'd like to do is to know historically if there's any validity to this. So what we did was we said, well, let's follow the reviews over time, and let's look at the market structure as a function of these characteristics of these attributes. Right? Can we recreate what the market looked like back then, or do we actually get a skewed picture of what the market looked like back then? Right? So what did we find? Right? So we collected about 10,000 online product reviews in the digital camera space. We did some surveys of consumers. Right? We asked them about the familiarity of certain attributes relative to the importance that they place on certain attributes when they're buying. Right? We compared the findings from VOC, what we call the voice of the customer, right? text mining online media, as opposed to looking at talking to experts and looking at expert buying guides. Right? So that was our reference. And what do we find? Broadly speaking, what we find is whatever you discover in online media actually reflects what people are actually looking at, what the people broadly, right? And this is including all of the noise, all of the bias that you would expect to find, right? But if what you're looking for is what are the attributes that people think are important, right? Importance here being measured in part by sentiment and mostly by term counts, right, or normalized term counts that if it's important in the online space, it's important to experts and it's important to consumers, to buyers that, that were surveyed, right? What's really interesting is that you find a certain set of attributes here in the tail where they only appeared in online product reviews. More interestingly, you find a few attributes in the upper tail that appeared only in the online space, right? Which goes to show us, and, and I want to be clear that there are a few attributes that the online community missed as well, right? So what we're suggesting here is that the online surveying is not a substitute, but it's a complement, right? This whole idea of did you talk to the financiers or did you talk to their spouses, right? And by looking online, we're accessing, uh, we're accessing spouses. We're accessing consumers. We're accessing needs that traditional methods were somehow missing. Does that intuition make sense? Right? Well, so that's just one measure, right? But John pointed out we could do some historical analysis. So 
This happens to be, so we looked at review, so we sort of set, split our data set. Looking at reviews up through 2005, we used market structure analysis. In this case, this is a view of the market space using correspondence analysis. It's a bit like multidimensional scaling, right, if people are familiar with those techniques. What we did was we took the data set, meaning the reference counts for all of the different things that people talk about, their sentiments, what they like, what they don't like. We did a principal components analysis to sort of reduce the number of attributes, right, to get it to a tractable number. This, of course, is the scree plot everyone remembers from their statistical marketing class, I'm sure. Right? Everyone's like, yeah, what is he talking about? <laughs> right? But the idea that it turns out that you can, in fact, map the market space with these two dimensions right, fairly cleanly. Right? And so what we find is that for a set of attributes that describes, broadly speaking, in F1, sort of characteristics or attributes that describe how easy to use a product is. So people talked about the navigation, the online navigation of the camera, storing pictures, and whether or not it could take video, right? Relative to the attributes that more sophisticated users look at, are there low light, you know, or, uh, ISO controls? You know, can I adjust? Uh, do I have interchangeable lenses? Right? What we find is these are how the brands compared to one another back in 2005. Does anyone remember, actually, does anyone here even have a digital camera right now, out of curiosity? Right. And the rest of you just use your cell phones, of course, right? But if we think back to 2005, who were the market leaders back then? Blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Canon, right? Who else? Nikon, so you see Nikon way out, way out here in space. We'll come back to Nikon in a minute. The market leaders back in 2005 were Canon, Kodak. Like, what happened to them, right? We'll talk more about Kodak later as well. <laughs> Kodak and Sony. Those were the three market leaders in digital cameras and digital imaging, consumer digital imaging in 2005. Right? And what you see here, right, we backed this up. We compared this to proprietary market research using traditional methods to understand what the market looked like. And this leader-follower market segmentation is essentially what is observed using sales data, using brand switching, using traditional methods. Right? You have Canon. You have, you have, first of all, you have Kodak, whose only right, affinity group, in some sense, was Hewlett Packard. And if you think about it, that makes sense. Right? What was Kodak's possibly, you know, not so successful foray. What was their en entree into the digital camera space? How did they present themselves? Easy printing, easy share, right? That's the byline, but it was easy printing, right? Their bread and butter is paper, and so that's what they wanted to focus on. E and Hewlett Packard, printers, right? It shouldn't be surprising that you see a cluster of competitors Right? that involves Kodak and Hewlett Packard. And in fact, if you look at marketing materials, Hewlett Packard was explicitly articulating a strategy that followed Kodak's. Yep. Do they also give a disposable digital camera, or is it easy to get your photos on an SD card or a CD? Right, so uh, external media, right? And what were they focusing on back in 2005? Uh, the, the primary driver, their strategic position, was to leverage everything into printing. So using media, right, external media, like an SD card, was so that you could plug it into a printer, you know, pull it straight out of the camera, plug it straight into the printer, and get your photos. But the bottom line for Kodak was still, right, they wanted you, they expected you as a consumer to want something in physical form. Right? Likewise, how did Canon, Fuji, and Casio end up together? Well, there were some external memory card standards, right, that they were collaborating on, right? Sony, Olympus, and Panasonic. Again, um, sort of the memory formats that they used, right? So you, you may or may not remember, but all these di different digital cameras had their own formats that they were using. And so to the degree that there was cross-compatibility with the formats that cameras used, you find a clustering of these products. So let's talk about Nikon. In 2005, Nikon doesn't look like they're anywhere in the game. And when we look at the marketing positioning of Nikon back in 2005, Nikon's explicit marketing position was, we are the camera of professionals, right? We have no, you know, I mean, 
this whole point and shoot consumer space, ah, it's a fad, right? We have no interest in getting down and dirty with the hoi polloi. We are the camera professionals. We're gonna focus on the professional branding. We'll focus on digital SLRs, right? That's the market that we're gonna target. And customers responded, right? I'm not gonna show you the, the, the follow-on slide, but when you look just two years later, not surprisingly, you've seen even tighter clustering in Nikon, you know, lo and behold, has joined the fold, right? But back in 2005, this is what the market looked like in terms of sales data, in terms of brand switching data, and in terms of the online community, right? The voice of the customer actually reflects the state of the market at the time, right? So the intuition being, is there validity in looking at, in mining, in searching this online media? Now, one other approach that I'll point out, right? Focus groups and interviews, user anthropology, social media, we can also model the system, right? To get a better understanding of what the underlying needs are. If we can properly model a system, we can better tease out where the opportunities are. Now, out of curiosity, how many people here have had the occasion to visit an emergency room sometime in the last, say, two years? So hopefully nothing serious. Out of curiosity, what was the longest somebody had to wait? Short is bad, right? If, if, if you immediately go in, that generally suggests something not so good has happened. So let's not talk about that. But what's the longest that someone actually had to wait? Six hours. Six hours. I was like, whoosh, boy, am I glad I'm not Zach. <laughs> right? Six hours. Anybody else? Not that long. Right. <laughs> Certainly not six hours, right? So this particular question has salience to me. Uh, why? Well, my wife happens to be an emergency room physician. Right? Uh, I have spent, uh, I've gone to her emergency room on at least two occasions, on two occasions, and never waited less than four hours. Right? So this whole friends and family plan, you know. <laughs> right? So the question is, why the heck do people have to wait so long? Right? So if we look at this picture, now I know you've all had, you know, OPM 630, 631, right? Everyone remembers back to the day, right? This should be familiar to you. This is, of course, a process model, right? This is a process model of the ED, uh, of ED patient flow, right? Patient comes in, triage, they get assigned a priority level, right? That's your triage level, one, two, three, or four. Depending upon how severe your, your injuries are, well, then you sit there and you wait. You wait for a long time up until you finally get a bed or a bed opens up, in which case you get treated or we'll call that service, and then they finally decide what to do with you, right? Where in this process is there any opportunity to speed this thing up, right? So one of the opportunities that people have been studying has to do with in this, servi whoops, in this, uh, in this service process, the tests that you take, right? So in hospitals, you go into the emergency room, they draw your blood to take, you know, to, to do some tests uh, to try and better understand what's going on inside your body. That blood sample gets sent to a central hospital lab, right? Of course, that central hospital lab gets shared with all the inpatients, the outpatient clinics. There's one lab all of these samples go to, to say nothing of the transport time to get the sample over, the results back, right? There's a lot of waiting going on. There's a lot of extraneous movement. And so people had this great idea, what if I could actually analyze the blood, conduct the tests in the emergency room itself? Right? Now, of course, it's more expensive to do this. It's more expensive because it takes personnel. You need more equipment that you need to move into the ED itself. But it's entirely possible that by testing in the ED, right, that the entire process can move more quickly. Right? And in fact, if I can move enough patients through more quickly, I can make up in scale my loss from excess, from the higher cost. Does that intuition make sense? Right? So it's all about volume, right? This, not surprisingly, has been tried in a number of different emergency departments around the country, actually around the, uh, around the world, right? It's been documented in a number of different papers in the medical literature. What they found is wildly divergent results. In some hospitals, some tests, they save a lot of time. Some hospitals, some tests, they don't save any time. And in some hospitals, some tests, it actually takes more time. It actually slows the entire process down. 
the interesting thing is to understand how hospital administrators chose how, how they got into this process. Right? You look at all the different studies were done, they're empirical studies, because different hospitals, they pick different tests. They tried different tests and they got different results, out of which they say point of care testing is a bad idea or it's a good idea. Why do you suppose hospitals would get such divergent results? Why would they vary so extremely? Laura? So say more about that. So Laura said different types of tests. How does the type of test make a difference to whether or not you save time? So, so Laura's actually pointing out two different things, right? The first observation is the test itself may take a certain amount of time. We can think of that as part of our service time definition. But what else did she say? She said, well, the patients who receive this test, right? If only one person out of a thousand actually needs this test, it's not clear that testing in the ED is going to save you a lot of time. Does that intuition make sense? Uh, Zach. So the integration of the results. So uh, in, in some instances, you know, does the lab computer tie into the emergency department system? Do I get the results instantaneously? Turns out that when you look at all the studies, you, when you do sort of a retrospective uh, analysis of the multiple studies, what you find is the real rate determining step on the back end is not so much getting the lab results back, it's getting the doctor to actually look at the results, right? Because they're busy circulating around the ED and it's an interrupt driven process, right? And so the results come back and then it sits there and waits for the doctor to come back. What else? Um, yep. So the, the speed of the, of the staff in some sense, right? And so I'm sure everyone remembers this, right? <laughs> this is, of course, the model for waiting time of a non-determinist, uh, of a non-preemptive priority queue, right? Everyone remembers their queuing model. What's more important, everyone remembers what I see over here, right? You remember this from 631. This is, of course, the coefficient of variation for arrival. Everyone's like, oh boy, right? Coefficient of variation in the service time, right? When I generate a better, when I generate an explicit model, and the reason we're using a non-preemptive priority queue is because, remember, patients get assigned a priority level, right? And what the model tells us is, depending upon your priority level, right? If you're a really sick person, you're not gonna wait, right? And so point of care testing really makes no difference because there is no waiting, right? You go directly, you know, you, you go directly to go, right? I, I was gonna say jail, but that doesn't sound quite the same, right? There's no waiting at all. It's only when the patient is, you know, priority four, you know, when what they really wanna do is just to tell you go, to, to go home, right? Come back later, right? Those patients stand to gain the most. That's what we see in an analysis of the non-preemptive priority queue. But the important point being the drivers of the waiting time are the, the Variation in the arrival rate, the patients that Laura was talking about, and the variation in the service time, right? We see this in terms of how many patients actually need this test, and how are they distributed across the priorities, right? We see the service time in staffing, which Nikhil mentioned, right? How efficient are these people actually doing the test, and the discrimination value of the test, which is what Laura was getting at. Right? Does this test actually end up saving you any time? Because once the result comes back, I can make a disposition decision based upon it. Right? If, it, if I don't do anything with these test results, it shouldn't be surprising at all that it doesn't make any difference in my service time. Right? It's by understanding the process, and in fact, this is a paper that I'm uh, working on right now as well, that we can look at this formal model to mine the online logs of a hospital to understand what the opportunities are. Which tests are the most promising for providing performance improvements? Does that intuition make sense? Because different hospitals have different patient populations, right? Different hospitals, therefore, would need to identify different tests to realize gains, right? And it's only by understanding the process that we can begin to understand and identify what criteria we use for selection. Intuition makes sense? So how do I find opportunities? Okay, now having said all of this about needing to know about needs, right? 
right? We have the much revered Steve Jobs, who, at least in some circles, has the final word. And he, of course, might stand up here and tell you everything I just told you is a, is a lot of hooey. Right? Ignore him. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Right? My wife says that too, but right? Why would Steve Jobs, and has, has Steve Jobs basically invalidated the last 30, 40 minutes of our conversation? Is the idea of talking to customers, learning the process, understanding the process, is that completely useless? Julie? So the key point that Julie is observing here is, remember, we are talking about identifying the problem, understanding the need. Right? Steve Jobs needed to understand needs as well. He's just making the observation that rather than doing explicit interviews, maybe there's another way of getting at that need. How did Steve Jobs do the oh, question, comment? You are? Yep, go ahead, you are? Ron. So they do work with lots of consumers or consumer data, Becca. So there's a service dimension to identifying the need, right? At least in the in the iPod case. Um, go ahead, John. He listened. To his wife, Wharton, <laughs> he listened. Actually, was she a Wharton grad or a? Yeah. Oh, there you are. <laughs> Heaven, you know that of course explains all of Apple's success, <laughs> right? Right. But the underlying point being, there's no getting around. If you want successful innovation, you need to understand the problem. You need to understand the need. How does Apple get around this? Right? They do do observation. They do do market research. Well, what, what might be thought of as non-traditional market research. They have the Apple stores, which, by the way, Steve Jobs continued to go into the Palo Alto Apple store right? to, to see what customers are saying, to see how customers interact with this product. Right? Perhaps most importantly, when we say, well, how do you understand what the needs are, two things. One. Apple develops with cross-functional teams, right? So it's not just a bunch of computer engineers in a room. It's not just a bunch of designers in the room, right? They pull in subject matter experts, right? So for example, when they made iMovie, they brought in producers, they brought in directors, right? This gets back to the idea of, right? How do we, f why are we pretty good at having the right discipline to think through whether a lot of other people are going to want it? because they bring in the subject matter experts that are actually doing this stuff. And when you do it for a period of time, certain things become salient. Right? So by building cross-functional teams, they get at the heart of what's the, what's the drivers? What are the drivers behind these needs? But perhaps the last thing to point out, right? you think about something like the iPod. Right? You think about someone like Scott Cook. Right? Anyone who's Scott Cook? Founder of Intuit. His big product, his big breakthrough product was? Quicken. Was Quicken, right? We, we are on tax season now, right? So, you know, TurboTax, but, right? It was Quicken. Scott Cook likes to say, I'm going to get the number wrong, you know, we had the 54th mover advantage, right, in this, you know, accounting software. Right? He wasn't the first person into the space. Right? There were lots of people competing, but by looking at all those competitors and looking at what they did wrong, Right? You get better understanding of what users are really looking for. Likewise, remember, the iPod wasn't the first player in the MP3 player game. Right? Zoom, which, by the way, wasn't the first player either. Right? It was a Korean product. And before that Korean product, 
right? There was, in fact, an early uh, product of Compaq, right? Their systems research lab down in Palo Alto, no less, actually produced in prototype form. Think of this as sort of like a Xerox Park Mouse invention, right? An early hard drive based MP3 player. Whoever heard, you know, I mean, Compaq, right? Doesn't even exist now since they were absorbing the Hewlett Packard, right? But the idea is, yeah, Steve Jobs may say don't do market research in a traditional sense, but there's no getting around, as Julie reiterated, you need to understand the underlying need. Okay? Yep. All right. Absolutely. 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 And understanding the complete user experience, right? The value that he placed on what the complete user experience is like, right? A critical success factor. Absolutely. Right. And of course, it, it's very difficult to systematically create another Steve Jobs, but how does one approach that? Right? And Apple approaches that through their cross-functional design. Right? So what are the processes that we can go through to try and approach this notion of identifying, right, if we have this value of the complete user ex experience, what does that entail? Right? I, I absolutely agree with you. Right? Let me say a few words since we're, we're pushing time here. We, we looked at a dimension of understanding needs. I want to take some time and look at the dimension of technology. Right? And this is generally, you know, uh, particularly salient because in a business audience, oftentimes there isn't as much technical expertise. And this question of, well, can I actually approach innovation from this standpoint? Right? How do I better understand the technology when I don't have a technology background to begin with? Well, is anyone familiar with this company, Truvio? Anyone ever used Truvio before? Anyone ever used the website CNET? A few of you have used CNET before, right? Anyone ever use uh, CBS Sports? Certainly for March Madness, right? You know, right? So at least one person follows college basketball, right? Um, AOL, Time Warner Video, right? right? Truvio is, so back before YouTube was bought by Google, Truvio was the single largest video search provider in the world. And in fact, today, Truvio is still the largest video search provider for professionally produced content. Right? Many of you probably haven't heard of Truvio because while they do have a customer-facing interface, they actually resell to Sports Illustrated, CBS Sports. Right? This is the underlying search engine for all of those, for all of those websites. Right? That's where Truvio bread and butter is, right? What's the story behind Truvio, right? So this company is only a few years old. The founder happened to be a classmate of mine at MIT and one of my, um, and one of my ultimate Frisbee teammates, right? You, you sort of see the difference in success trajectories, right? So where did this idea come from? So Tim was actually working on startup number N, right? And so he had some time on his hands, sat down, literally, like this is as he tells it, right? Sat down in a basement by himself. And over the period of several months, he went to the top 10 computer science departments in the country, downloaded every research paper published the last year. He then went to the National Science Foundation and looked at every project that they funded in the last year, downloaded every research paper associated with those projects. He then went to the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency and looked at every project sorry, in the computer information science technology space that they had uh, funded and downloaded those research papers. He read every one of them. He created a, 
a 60-page document, right, summarizing the different research and different intuitions, ideas that came out of reading about those technologies. From that 60-page document, he narrowed down to three ideas, none of which, by the way, was trivial. But he picked <laughs> one idea, right? But you know, it was related, right? It had to do with video search, right? In fact, the genesis behind Truvio was what? It was for online television programming indexing and search, right? So you know, who 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 has not used that Comcast controller to try and figure out what's not right? I mean, a ridiculous interface. I can't believe that they still use this, right? <laughs> and so. It, out of all the research that he did, right, the in initial seed was it was related to search, but it had to do with on-screen you know, television search. Right? And you can see how it pivoted over the next several months into what we see today. Right? But it all started with this very systematic processing and search of the technology space. He didn't actually drive any of those technologies. That wasn't his research. But he took the time to survey what was in the field. And that's something that any of us can do, irrespective of whether, you know, we could certainly do that if we were working in a large organization, but we could also do that on our own. Right? So surveying the research, understanding what's out there, right? It's one approach. A second approach that I'll call Rembrandt's in the attic, right? This is based upon um, a, the book by some folks at Harvard Business School. And the idea of looking for alternative applications of existing technologies, right? This is a big story. We're sort of all familiar with these sort of venerable names. What's their big, what were they known for two decades ago? Right? That was their big product, both of them competing in the film space. Right? How did they attempt to navigate the migration to digital? I mean, obviously, they pursued lots of different streams. They have lots of different sub-industries. But what was the primary you know, strategy as people moved into the digital realm? It was printing, right? Fujifilm was no different from Kodak. Right? And of course, there are different offshoots. But they said, well, this is my cash cow. This is my bread and butter. This is the, you know, I'm going to try and build around this thing. And yet, Fujifilm didn't, you know, isn't on the verge of declaring bankruptcy. Right? What did they do differently? Right? Anyone ever hear of Astalift? It's a facial cream, right? Yes, both companies have health products divisions because they do you know, medical imaging. But health creams, health products, where does this come from? Fujifilm realized that they weren't just a photographic paper company. They were a chemical company. And the same chemicals that they use to prevent fading on paper could be used in other places. Where else are people concerned about fading? Wrinkles, right? On their face, right? It's this kind of creativity that has, and in fact, uh, I think it's less than one, it's around 1% of revenue for Fujifilm now comes from film, right? This is the kind of diversification they were doing. Looking for applications of the patents and the existing technology that they already have in house, right? So General Electric, right? huge company that we're all familiar with. Certainly, if you've spent any time in the Philadelphia campus, you're very familiar with the New England Corridor. right? You've all seen these trains going through 30th Street Station. So General Electric makes locomotives. They make MRI machines, all kinds of medical imaging devices. They make aircraft engines. Right? But this year, January of this year, General Electric has committed a billion dollars into software systems development software systems development into network integration, right? This is the realm of companies like IBM Global Systems, or Global Solutions, excuse me, right? This is Accenture. This isn't General Electric, right? General Electric just signed a contract with Norfolk Southern, right? Just earlier this year, signed a contract with Nor Norfolk Southern to actually manage their train logistics. Why? Because what General Electric discovered is, hey, all of the sensors that we put into the locomotives to figure out when this thing needs to be repaired, Right? which part of the train is breaking down. That sensor network that we built up, that capability that we have, we might as well be tracking these locomotives across the network and telling you where they are. And we can throw some optimization algorithms 
on top of that, oh, that's 621, right? To figure out how you manage your inventory. Inventory, in this case, being trains, uh, the locomotives as well as the cars, right? Likewise, MRI machines are great, but hey, all the data that our machines are generating, they have to flow into the patient record somehow. Lo and behold, they just entered the patient record business, right? Likewise, aircraft engines, right? Well, they go onto aircrafts. They do flight avionics to manage the engines for maintenance purposes. And so they've now entered into, if you're familiar with, uh, it, it's a NASA approach. It's called free flight, new air, air traffic control strategy, right? That has to do with onboard navigation. And so they've now expanded into this space as well. It's understanding what your core competency is and then understanding how you take that same capability and apply it to a different set of needs, right? More broad, so this is all internal to a company, right? This is what General Electric did. This is what Kodak or Fujifilm did. But you may be familiar with the broader term called open innovation, right? So how can a single institutional organization reach beyond their boundaries, look outside the scope, and leverage this information, right? So who's familiar with gyration? Tell me, tell me about gyration. Uh, it's, um, you know, one more time. Yeah. Your name again is? Right, so their big thing is controller, right? So wireless, motion, mount, mice, that's their big product. They also do television remote controls, right? Gyration, sounds like a huge, you know, deep familiarity with this product, I can see, right? How many people have seen this? Right. This is the Nintendo Wii controller. Nintendo actually found gyration and licensed their gyroscopic technology to use in the controller. It's understanding this need and then going out and finding the technology. Right? Applica and for gyration, this is a different application that they had envisioned. This is not what they built out. So finding alternate applications of the existing technology and looking outside your company to do so. Right? There's a large... Uh, effort in the pharmaceutical development space. So you have Avastin, which is you know, a cancer-finding agent, huge in the press recently because of the FDA's decision related to breast cancer treatments. right? But Avastin actually has a huge off-label use, right? combating macular degeneration. Right? Likewise, AZT, which was initially developed as an antiviral for cancer fighting, Right? because there was a theory that cancer was caused by viruses, it then turned around to be used as, a, as an AIDS drug. Right? And the strategies for trying to approach this, there are several different companies now that are focusing on these alternative applications of pharmaceuticals. What they do is they mine databases of drug-drug interactions to try and understand what the underlying mechanisms are and look for drug mechanisms to look for new applications of the existing technology. In fact, uh, working with Steve Kimbrough, and, uh, who's in OPUM, and Ian McMillan, who's in the management department that some of you guys may know, we've done some research on mining patent databases, text mining over patent databases, with the same idea in mind. How do you understand the underlying applications of this technology, i.e., you know, Teflon, it's this slippery substance. It also has certain thermal properties. Can I find other needs, other patents in disparate spaces that are addressing the same problems? Look for alternate applications of existing technologies. Right? So if innovation is a match between a solution and a need, to understand opportunity, I need to systematically search the space of needs, and I need to systematically search the space of solutions. And there are a number of processes that I can use, whether it's systematically surveying the research, surveying my available intellectual property, or others, if you think in terms of open innovation, or going through a process to understand customers and their underlying needs. Right? That's a process for navigating the opportunity space and for identifying opportunity. So I'm two minutes over, and I apologize, but appreciate your time.